Welcome to our uh, presentation, If These Hands Could Talk, Reflections from a Batter Accountability Program. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about this program. So this is part of a series that we offer um, students and others. It's titled A Day in the Life. And usually we have um, other psychologists, a day in the life of an IO psychologist or a day in the life of a developmental psychologist. And we use that as a way for students to be introduced to all of the ways that they could use their degree, um, what a day in the life of a different kind of psychologist looks like, um, what kinds of things they do, what types of research they're involved in. But last semester, um, Kendall came forward and she told me about this wonderful project that she was working on and we decided that it would be a good idea to sort of expand this day in the life to include a day in the life of one of our graduate students so that the community could see what we were doing um, and what our students were doing and also so that it could inspire other students in the program. So Kendall is a student in our developmental psychology program and we also have an IO track as well. And Kendall um, started in spring of 16, which was the first semester that we launched the program. So she's been with us from the beginning. Um, she stood out right from the very beginning with her um, academic success. She was a very strong student. And so we actually um, approached Kendall with a project we were doing, a partnership with Gothamist um, to do a student profile. And from there, um, we got to know her a little bit more. And as I said before, she um, told us about this wonderful project she was working on. So we're excited to share that with you this evening. Um, Kendall's going to tell you about the, pro uh, the project, how it came to be. Um, she's going to walk you through some of the artwork that came from that project. We'll have a little bit of a Q&A afterward, and then we'll welcome you to walk around the halls and to view all of the beautiful pieces. Okay. With that, I'll turn it over to Kendall. So come on up. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and listen to me talk tonight. Um, I'm actually going to start with a little meditation exercise, if you would do that with me. Um, the director of the Violence Intervention Project, um, which is the pro program that I worked with and will be talking about, um, the director starts her meetings with them each week. So if you would, please, um, just close your eyes and take a deep breath. Leave everything outside and really try to focus on what we are doing here tonight. Take one more deep breath. Please open your eyes and let's begin. That was probably more helpful to me than it was to you, but <laughs> away we go. All right, so a little bit about myself. Um, I graduated in 2015 with my bachelor's degree in psychology from the College of Staten Island. Um, this is another great program that I was involved in um, and I highly recommend it if um, you are sincerely looking to get into psychology. Um, currently, I am working on my master's in developmental psychology through the online courses offered at CUNY SPS. Um, I am looking forward in the future to progressing towards my PhD. Um, I want to focus on behavioral neuroscience, which works with uh, human behavior. Um, my ed I have been working in education for just over 10 years. Um, I have been in multiple settings with different age groups from infants uh, to adolescents who are at risk um, to other people in high school um, and also senior citizens. I have been in special uh, needs programs and regular education programs. Um, currently, I work in a first grade integrated classroom at a charter school on the Lower East Side. Um, so a little bit about why I chose um, to work uh, to come to SPS and why developmental I chose development developmental psychology. Um, I had really never taken online classes before, um, and it really intrigued me. And I found out that I, it was a great convenience, and I really loved it. Um, so I have interacted with some amazing people from around the country and other parts of the world. Um, this has allowed me to open up my knowledge base and help my education to grow. Um, SPS also has great professors, advisors, and support staff. Um, I have never had a problem getting a hold of someone or getting proper advice. Um, and why I chose developmental psychology was because I already have an extensive history working um, with a variety of age groups. And since my interests lie in understanding human nature and the relationship between early and later experiences, it made uh, it just made sense. Um, my later work will focus on intervention with those children who are at risk 
um, of committing acts of violence later on in life after being exposed to domestic violence at an early age. So um, now I'm going to get to like what I'm going to be going through. Um, so I will actually um, start with the project's inspiration. Um, I will be going through, not in depth, don't worry, the steps from Research 101, um, such as turning world, real world inspiration into research question, development of the project and its steps. Um, then I will be moving into the Violence Intervention Project, um, which is the program that I worked with. Um, then talk about the men behind the photos and kind of let you know a little bit of who they are before you walk around and see them. Um, and lastly, um, I want to tell you where the project is now and where I want to take it. Excuse me. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so the inspiration. So my inspiration came from um, something that we probably do every day, which is scroll through our Facebook feed. Um, and I actually came through, uh, came past a BuzzFeed article, and this article was um, about a man whose name is Trent Bell. Um, he's an architecture photographer um, who actually had a close friend who was um, uh, incarcerated. And um, this inspired him to create a photo series of inmates who were serving long-term sentences. Um, the inmates were asked to write letters to their younger selves about maybe what they could have done differently um, other than ending up in uh, incarcerated uh, for long-term sentences. Um, it was a very emotional um, video to watch um, and to see the families actually go through and look at the pictures and read the letters. Um, it was really quite gut-wrenching. Um, so after watching that video, um, my brain wheel started turning and I thought, is there any way that I can apply this to my field of interest? And in fact, there it was. So I made the call. I made the call to the director of the local program that worked with men who committed acts of domestic violence and they said, hey mom, I have an idea for a project. She said, great, and away we went. So my mom is actually the director of the Violence Intervention Project. Um, and the VIP project, a Violence Intervention Project, or VIP, um, is a batterer accountability program in Plattsburgh, New York. It is currently uh, serving Clinton and Essex counties. So Plattsburgh, I don't know if anybody really knows where that is, but that is the true upstate. It is above Albany. Um, let's see. Uh, so I said it was a batterer accountability program, and accountability is the key word. Um, it is important for these men who attend these groups to be conscious that their behavior is not acceptable, not a good way to problem solve, and they have to be held accountable for their behaviors, find a different way to problem solve, learn to change their language from you to I rather than bullying their and abusing their victims. Um, this is a 33-week program. It's uh, two hours a week. Uh, it averages about 35 men. Most of the men are court mandated, but even then the program only receives two out of a hundred convictions for domestic violent cases. Um, there may be a few reasons for this. Um, this is most probably due to the whole idea of better accountability being controversial in this culture. We still have a core belief that this is family business, not anybody else's. Um, and that on some level, this has to be the victim's fault or the victim has to have played some part in causing this behavior. This, of course, is not true, but it's what we have come to believe as a culture. Um, domestic violence cases are also much less sanctioned than stranger cases. A stranger assault may get you seven to 10, whereas um, domestic violence may only get you three. Um, this system is still very much a patriarchy. My mom has actually heard judges say, if she were my wife, I'd hit her too. Uh, it's very uh, volunteers who come into the program. Um, it is very rare to have volunteers in the groups. Uh, probably one out of 100 actually volunteer. Uh, they don't stay um, if there isn't a reason to keep them there, like like being court mandated. Um, they do volunteer because the victims have said, do this or I will leave you. And as soon as they convince their victim that I'm getting help um, and that I'm trying to do better, they, uh, they quit. 
Um, most of the men are low income, blue collar workers. They are, um, tend to be powerless with, uh, they don't have good lawyers. Uh, we don't get, uh, the program does not get the rich because they are able to buy their way out with uh, good lawyers. Um, the men are responsible for paying um, certain fees. Um, the men pay $25 a week um, in dues. Um, there is also a fee for the initial interview when they are mandated to the program. There is a disability fee cut, but no one really uses this because the programs, it's the costs are just very minimal. Um, DUI and substance abuse programs are much, much higher. Um, in the VIP program, there are 11 themes that they talk about. The program goes over in the 33 weeks. Um, they talk about physical violence, threatening and making threats, isolation, intimidation, respect, having sexual respect, accountability and honesty, support and trust, negotiation um, in, and fairness, uh, children, uh, the effects on children, economic abuse and privilege. Um, the ultimate end goal of the 33 weeks is for the courts and for the program administrators is that they actually complete the program. Um, this shows a willingness to come every week and that they were able to understand the notion that they are part of this community and they need to pay their debt. Um, this program looks at the victims as their primary clients and not as the men. This is very few ways that the victims are actually getting some kind of justice. Um, an important piece to all of this is that there wouldn't be any victims if there weren't batterers. This program is in the business of intervention and prevention of the creation of victims. Oh, well, I guess I should have put that up. Well, went over everything. Okay. So now we move into the actual project itself. Um, the project is called If These Cans Could Talk and focuses on the hands because when I personally think of domestic violence, I think of crimes that are being commi committed um, when someone uses their hands. Um, domestic violence also incorporates mental and verbal abuse, but I focus on the physical aspect. Um, I use the project as an accountability exercise and wanted to encourage the men to really reflect and look inward at their actions that they had taken, ask themselves, what have I really done with these hands? What should I have done differently? I wanted them to really understand what they have been responsible for doing to their victims with the use of their hands. I wanted them to make a visual connection between the actions and the physical presence of their hands. What should their hands really be used for? Some of them were really able to do this and it was very present in their letters. Okay. So the men were presented with the project two weeks prior to me coming in to take their pictures. It was overall a three week process. Um, in week one, it was a lot of roughing and crafting and discussing and trying to understand the question. Um, this is where we got a lot of the feedback from the men that they didn't really understand what they what I was looking for with just saying if these hands could talk. Um, so we added uh, what would people, what would they say to people I have hurt. Um, this made it a little bit easier to wrap their heads around um, what I was really looking for. They were given an outline that was broken into two parts. Um, part one was asking them um, as to write as much as they wanted um, to answer the question. They were asked to be honest and told it was okay to express whatever feelings they had. And part two of the outline described how a photographer from New York City, me, um, would be coming up to take pictures of their hands, um, acting out. Um, they wrote um, what they wrote in their in their um, in their letters. Um, it was explained that the photos would be totally anonymous and would not show their faces or reveal their identity in any way. They were told that uh, we would be choosing from different presentations depending on variety, creativity, sincerity, and that it would be displayed in Plattsburgh area and possibly areas of New York City. Um, in week two, they began putting down their real thoughts in their own hand. I really wanted them to write the letters themselves and uh, keep any imperfections and maintain authenticity. When you go around and look at their letters, there's a lot of misspellings um, and some of the handwriting is really scratchy, but I just really wanted you to get the sense of um, that this was coming from them. Um, 
So some of them finished their letters during the time of the second week, but most of them did not. Um, so we let it continue into uh, week three. There was some resistance with this exercise. Um, so a few of the men didn't see that they had done anything wrong and would say, I'm not doing it because it was asking them to admit something um, that they thought that they just didn't do. Um, they were uh, still placing the blame on the victim and wouldn't take responsibility. But since my mom had made it a required exercise, some of them did it just to do it, but they put very little effort into it. Um, and week three was where I came in. Um, no one knew that my mom and I were related, so she was Pat and I was Brittany or Brit. And we uh, practiced on the car ride over, and I was like, Pat, Pat. Pat. She was like, Brit, Brit, Brit. And so we really thought that like in some way or another, we were really going to slip up. We actually did a really good job. So I was like, you know, all right, you're not mom. You're not mom. You're Pat. Um, so she actually didn't even tell the facilitators that uh, the facilitators of the people that she works with until um, all of the men were actually gone. Um, because she just didn't want any indication that the two of us were related. Um, so I went um, to each weekly group, um, Monday through Thursday. The process was the same for each group. There would be a meditation exercise. The, uh, the men would hand in their fees, and attendance was taken, and I was introduced. Um, the, the men were allowed to work on their letters if they needed to, and when they were done, we had a small studio set up um, where it was explained where, um, excuse me, where uh, it was ex what the process was going to be explained to them, and they were asked to sign a release. Um, they were asked if they were wearing anything such as jewelry, watches, or top layer clothing that was identifiable to that they wanted to remove. Um, one of the men actually told me that he had a rare genetic condition in his thumbs that could identify him, but he had thought of a pose that would hide that. Um, some of the men had really thought about what they wanted to. The, the way that their hands to be, um, but for others I made suggestions based on what I read in the letters. Um, some made multiple hand gestures. All of them were appropriate. No one gave me the bird. Um, I used a small point and shoot digital camera. We were all good. So this is actually a copy of the release that we used. Um, it's explaining um, that they were allowing me to use the, their pictures for the project. They were all you know, perfectly fine with it. They just came in, they signed, shoot, 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 and we were done. Um, for the following 11 slides, I will be pre presenting the actual project to you and giving a bit of background on each of the men that was selected for the project. Um, I wanted to do this so that when you read the letters um, and look at their photographs, you can get a better sense of who they are and why they're, we're asking them to hold themselves accountable. Um, I used fake names um, for each of them. There's only one name um, that I will say that is his real name, and that's because I have explicit permission to do so. Um, and I will explain why when I get to his slide, why I'm allowed to do so. Um, they were assigned numbers um, so we could keep track of them, but in presenting them, I didn't want to use those numbers, so we used fake names. Okay, so, so this is Bobby. Um, with this project, it was the very first time that he had been heard admitting to a specific behavior. Before this, everything was what? Me? I haven't really done anything. In group, he was very evasive, which is typical when talking about specifics of what they have done. Nothing is forced. It has to come from them. It is, uh, it is more valid that way. He talked about for the first time that he had forcefully pushed. And as he went on in the program, after he took his first step of admittance, he became more and more accountable and more specific about what he had done. This is George. Um, George was admitted to the program because he murdered his intimate partner. When looking at the photograph, there is a real religious feel. He wanted to display the namaste pose. In group, he hid behind religion and tried to put up a religious front. Unfortunately, it's all window dressing. Um, he did, on some level, feel remorse and express remorse for what he had done, but George is back in prison for assault. This is Nick. Um, 
Nick has an extremely long history of manipulation and trying to get his way. In his letter, he talks about how he has been doing this for 40 years. He completed the program twice and made several other attempts and reoffended while he was in the program during one of his other attempts. He is now trying to be there for the children that he has had throughout his lifetime. He had never had time uh, for a relationship with them while they were growing up. Um, he was very busy moving through multiple relationships, but now that he is older, he is trying to make efforts, but the children are really giving him a rough time and don't really want much to do with him. Um, this is Greg. So his pose is actually very typical of the way he was in group. His hand is outstretched, but then with one in the pocket, sort of behind a little hidden. Um, he was only willing to put forth himself so much. Um, the first parts of his letter, he uses I, which is symbolic of the hand, which is outstretched. Um, like you see here, uh, this is what I will give you. Um, but in the rest of the letter, there are no I statements. And that's the hand that's in the back pocket. He chose to say when violence is acceptable, when he could have said, I chose to use violence. There is never a real admit admittance to any wrongdoing, and he kind of skirts it, but that was typical. He was another frequent offender and was back in the program several times. He actually started in the Young Men's Offender Program, um, but as he got older, he really started to understand that he doesn't want to keep doing this anymore, and what is the point? He also has a teenage son who is exhibiting a lot of the uh, behaviors that he exhibited, and he just does not want this life for his child. This is Ben. Ben is very young. He is 19, maybe 20, and he is a substance abuser, and this made him full of excuses for his behavior. He used to say, the drugs are causing this. He uh, spent a lot of time getting him to understand that he was responsible for his own violent behavior and drug use. He really thought that people owed him. Um, he did make it through the program and he's doing okay now, hoping that since he is so young, um, he can make the changes in his behaviors and stay away from abusing substances. Uh, Billy. Billy is a bright young man. He's really articulate and book smart. You just wonder because he has a few things going for him. He's in college, but he has a severe alcohol issue. And again, like Ben, he uses that an as an excuse to lash out and also has a lot of expectations of himself and other people to get him to help um, to get where he feels like he needs to be. He gets disappointed a lot and takes out that disappointment with the use of violence. Um, he has goals, um, so we'll see if he uh, is able to reach them, but he was certainly one of the more accountable men in group as far as taking responsibility for his behavior and talking about his issues. In his letter, he talks about being selfish, um, which is really key because a lot of them have a very hard time understanding that they are being selfish with their behavior. This is Jimmy, and as you can see from his uh artwork, he's very talented. Um, so he is the man that I spoke about that has the genetic condition um, with his thumbs. Um, and as you can see, he came up with a pose that tucked them in, which actually worked really well and looks very nice with his uh, writing. Um, he's a very talented guy, works with his hands, and always talks about the creative part, but also understood that he used his hands as tools of destruction. He was very difficult in group. He did not want to be there, did not want to take responsibility for a long time, then got into some trouble in the group and was put on suspension, but still had to come to group without getting any credits for the group, and he was not happy. Um, he was actually one of the few cases where the judge and the probation were really holding him accountable, and it woke him up. So he was very conscious that he was being seen in a way that he did not like to be seen, and it embarrassed him. It, he was able to change his demeanor in group, and he became more involved, and we'll see where it goes. But on the surface, there was some change. This is Robert. He had some shame and recognition of what he had done to the mother of his children. Another bright guy with a good future if he chooses to do something about it. He does have several children, so unfortunately he doesn't have a lot of time um, to do anything uh, creative with his future. Um, talked 
a lot in group about how he doesn't want his children to witness or display violent behaviors. There is a recognition of his struggle and the struggle of his partner. He's very grateful to his partner ha having stuck by him, but it is up to him if he is not going to use his hands to hurt anymore. So this is Danny. Um, his real name is David. Um, David and his partner have been together for 41 years. Um, he used his fists on his partner for over 30 of those years. His partner stuck by him until a certain event that she still can't talk to talk about to this day. Um, and she said, jail will not help him. He needs something else. So he was admitted to VIP. Um, he noticed um, that he was uh, much like the men that he sees in group now. His head was down. He didn't really talk a lot until they started talking about family, and this really hit home for him. He completed the program and did not reoffend. He actually returned to the program as a volunteer to help the other men who were going through it. And since 2000, he was actually hired as a facilitator. Um, and he actually helps lead uh, program meetings. Um, his letter takes the spiritual route. His pose is actually really interesting, is known as the proper fist in karate. He said it is unacceptable to use a proper fist for an improper purposes, and hitting women is an improper purpose. This is Ray. His writing is almost a poem, expressing an openness, but knowing him, his words are just falling right through his open fingers. He was sent by parole, and he was within five weeks of completing the program, but dropped it because he, was, he got off of parole and faded off of the map. He does have a young child, and we don't know if this is the reason why he stopped coming, but again, if you don't have to be there, they won't come. He put forward this wonderful piece of work and think he's really getting it, but the effort falls short when the chips are down. He didn't have to go through it and was faced with, well, I can complete it because I only have five weeks left, or I can just drop it and take the easy way out. He took the easy way out. How would this make you feel if you were his victim? This is Mike. Mike is an interesting character. Um, his picture is of a heart in front of a torn shirt, and this is actually incredibly significant of him because during his time, it was obvious that he could be loving, caring, and accountable, but then for whatever reason, switch on a dime and be this jealous, green-eyed monster who would, be, who would terrify his victim. Constantly going back and forth, and you never really know, knew which version of him you were going to get. Sometimes he would be really receptive, and other times he would be really disruptive or wouldn't participate. So this photo speaks very much to how he actually was and his victim's ripped heart and how you do, um, and how do you function in a relationship where you never really know who you are going to get. But on the flip side, how do you leave a relationship like that? It's very often found that victims have a hard time leaving violent relationship because it's not like that all the time. Sometimes they can be very loving, and it's not a crime to love someone who hurts you. It's a crime to hurt someone you love. It's not about victims and why they stay. It's about why these men hurt the people they love. So where are we now? It's getting there. Um, the process does take a while, and if there aren't any men who are willing to put the effort in, then the project does fall a little flat. Um, but recently, we did get uh, one who was really putting it on the page. Um, sorry, I know this. I'll, I'll read it. Um, this is Don's letter. Um, this is significant for Don because this is the first time he entertained this possibility. Um, here he is talking about uh, blacking out and not being sure of what he did. We are not sure if this is real or imagined, but he is still in that headspace. Um, he has a very long history of being physically violent towards men, especially the new partners of his ex-partners. Um, before I read it, I just want to say that um, recently in group, the men have been presented with this project, um, and it's really been kind of impactful for them to see that um, other men who have gone through the program 
um, and, and written these letters, and he has kind of made the comment that, you know, it's not just, you know, his group, it's not just him, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a variety of people who are committing these crimes. So his letter says, if my hands could talk, they'd tell you I'm ashamed, ashamed of the pain, the emotional pain I've brought on you and your child. I'm restless. I'm restless from tossing and turning caused by the nightmares that come haunt me every night from the possibility of me physically hurting you and the emotional abuse I know I've inflicted. If my hands could talk, they would fill me and shed light on this so I can stop wondering and finally put my mind at rest. If my hands could talk, they would say, wash me. Wash the blood from, my from me so I can be cleansed. If my hands could talk, you'd hear remorse for all I've done. I've ruined you by cheating and lying and screaming and blaming you for everything. I've ruined our family. If my hands could talk, they finally say thank you for putting up with me and giving me the chance after chance, though I never deserved it. So how do I want to build on this project? Well, I'm hoping to implement this project um, in this area. I also want to implement it in adolescent and intervention programs um, that work with teen offenders. I want this project to influence community involvement and try to take away uh, the thought of, of our culture that I talked about earlier and talking about um, how it, I don't want it to be seen as controversial anymore. Um, I also want to expand the program into other programs that I'm involved in, um, such as Dude, that Rude, Dude That's Rude, um, which is uh, focuses on sexual assault. Um, that's what this t-shirt is about, and I actually have some information up here if you are interested in that. Um, it puts the responsibility back on men, asking them to tell uh, from, men, from man to man that it's not okay to use explicit sexual language with women. Um, so I can't speak for all programs like VIP, but I know funding doesn't come easy. Um, at the beginning of the year, my mom found out that Clinton County Department of Social Services, who is a major contributor for her funding, will no longer be making their contribution. The program um, that runs VIP, which is called BHSN, um, almost stopped the program entirely until my mom stepped in and said, no way. Um, are these men just getting let go? Um, what kind of message is that sending to the men, to their victims? Um, so she is keeping the program going for the men that are currently um, mandated for the program until July of this year. Um, they are not admitting any more men um, because, you know, it's, it's ending. Um, so those who are committing acts of domestic violence, she honestly really doesn't know um, where they are going, which is very concerning. Um, the message is out there that there is no program for these men to be out uh, to be sent to. Um, it's ironic because there's a lot of support for the program in the community, but nobody is coming forward to put any uh, to put any money into it. Um, so now it's really up to the community. So I really want to leave you with a lot. I've probably given you a lot to think about, um, but mostly I want you to think about uh, three key things. The first thing is the, the language needs to change. We have to be really conscious of labels that we are putting on things and the language that we use that is accepted in our culture. We have to, uh, we have really had to become more accountable for our own actions and ask those around us to be accountable as well. Um, one thing that really bothers me about our culture is that it is socially acceptable to call a white ribbed tank top that both win men and women wear a uh, wife beater. Um, that I, I, I've never seen the tank top beat anybody up, um, so I would not call it a wife beater. I would call the person who is wearing the wife beater, and unfortunately, um, people call it a wife beater. Um, the uh, excuse me. So the, the secondly, um, we have talked about um, how this is no longer a family business, um, and this is happening behind closed doors, and this is happening to families, but it is no longer just family business. People are being hospitalized and even dying at the hands of people that they love. Love shouldn't hurt. Um, and lastly, the point that I really want you to go home with is that without batterers, there are 
uh, would not be any victims. We need to recognize to, to prevent victims, we have to eliminate the problem of the batterer. The only person who can protect the victim is the batterer themselves in solving the problem of their behavior. It's up to them. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kendall. You're welcome. I, I want to open it up for questions. Um, we're going to take questions from all of you in the audience, and we'll also alternate um, and accept questions from our online community that's joining us um, in wherever they happen to be. Um, so I'll turn it over to you. Is there anyone that has any questions? I'm happy to bring the microphone over to you. I was just wondering, because you spoke a lot about men, and I know I was a little late, but um, so it's never a situation where women may be abusive as well. Um, in this program, no, they just don't have the population for it, um, unfortunately. And I also talked to my mom about um, the LGBTQ community. Um, our community is just, there just really isn't the population for it, unfortunately. If she had the funds um, to expand the program, then we possibly could be able to do that, but right now there are no women in the program. Hi, Kendall. Hi. Uh, first of all, the program was gorgeous and the photographs are so touching. I, oh. I found it hard to read some of them. I started <laughs> crying. Um, and I'm heartbroken to hear that the, the program might be discontinued. Mm -hmm. My question for you would be, has your mother considered crowdfunding or putting online uh, the program to see if people would be willing to contribute uh, through something like Kickstarter or uh, something like that. Those are really great suggestions. Um, I honestly can't answer that because I don't know if she has done that or not. Um, she hasn't said. I think she's pre pretty much put it on the community and put it out there um, and it's just kept it pretty local. Um, but those are good suggestions so um, I can get back to you on that. No, oh, thank you. Are there questions in the room? Okay, I think I'll take a question from over here. Any questions? Do you know any other of the, uh, the specifics of the case now? Was he out? Uh, this was post-prison, and he, had, I assume, served a long sentence, and then what, this was part of the... Yeah, so this is process? part of, yeah, so he was, um, a lot of the guys come from parole and probation, so if they're on parole or probation, they're mandated to come to um, the domestic violence, the VIP program, um, and try to go through the 33 weeks. So he was trying to go through the 30 weeks, uh, 33 weeks. I'm unaware if he finished the program before he uh, re-offended, um, but now he is back in prison for assault. Hi. Um, are the battered spouses at any point in time a part of the therapeutic process for these gentlemen? Um, they can be. Um, like, for instance, um, David's partner has been very involved um, because you. a lot of it is like the family aspect of it. So they're allowed to, um, I don't know if they're allowed to come into the groups, but um, they're affiliated with another program that is a, like a victim advocate program and a lot of times they teach the victims to speak up for themselves and she is a big advocate in that. That's amazing. Hi. Um, first, fantastic, moving, oh, thank powerful. You. Thank you. Amazing, really. Um, I was a photography major and was moved by every single picture in here, so wonderful oh, job <laughs> and connection. Um, so my question is more of going forward, mm -hmm. what's your vision in connecting this to the kids? You said you were um, interested in... Yeah, so uh, in the future I want to work with um, children who come from, you know, homes who uh, have seen domestic violence. Um, and so I want to work with intervention programs. So I don't exactly know how this project will... Um, Inter, you know, intertwine with that. Um, but I wanted to extend this project into, um, you know, adolescent and teen, and so that would also work with the intervention programs who um, who are children of, you know, domestic violent homes. So you know, who don't go into the the children intervention programs, they make it into the adolescent intervention program. So this might work in in some way, getting there. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay, sorry. 
I'm still working on it. <laughs> so, um, so in this particular program, um, it's a variety of age groups, um, but they don't generally get, um, there is a younger men's program, um, but I didn't work with the younger men's program. Um, it's, it's a very small program. Um, but I, so this would probably, I mean, the youngest man that I worked with was one of the ones that I talked about who was um, 18 or 19. And then the oldest um, man that I worked with was probably in his like 70s, the one that had been doing this for about 40 years. So it's, it, it really, it depends. Um, but it's, it is a, a variety of, of ages. And Kendall, I had a question. You had mentioned uh, Danny, I believe his name was, and you said his real name is his David. His real name is David. Yes. And um, you had said he had given you explicit permission to use yes. his name. And mm -hmm. did he sort of tell you why he he didn't want to go by a, a pseudonym that he why he wanted you to sort of um, use his name? Because he's he's actually since he came out of the program, he was a huge advocate for the program. And so he's actually done like a lot of uh, newspaper articles with him and his partner. Um, he's got, uh, he's done a lot of um, things in the community. So he's, he's very comfortable with saying, hey, this is, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Um, I'm paying my debt to society kind of thing. Great. Uh, I saw a hand back here. Okay. Doing my best talk show host impression. <laughs> Uh, hi, I was just curious about, you had referenced earlier that um, a lot of the men were denying things or were in denial, and I was just kind of curious, were they denying that they were um, physically battering people? Yeah, or were they, they, denying, were, they were okay. denying that they had done anything wrong. They were blame, blaming it on their victims. They were saying, she made me do it. And so they really weren't recognizing that they had physically harmed somebody in some way or just because they were, you know, shouting at somebody, you know, it, it turned into like death threats. You know, they didn't see that as, as wrong because, you know, they explicitly didn't, they, they ended up putting their hands on somebody, but they also didn't recognize that that type of behavior was unacceptable. That's what I was curious about. I, I was trying to figure out if they were saying I didn't hit her, but you know, but they did. Mm -hmm. They did, okay. yeah, yeah. In, so, in some form or another, they did, yes. Got it. Do you know how many of these men have been battered themselves? Um, I honestly don't. Um, I heard something about a figure of like 70% will actually end up, you know, like reoffending if they come from domestic violent homes. Some of them are you know, repeating the cycle coming from domestic violent home. I don't know how many of these men specifically are, um, but I, I know a few of them are, yeah. Hi, I know you spoke on how you had someone come back and advocate for the program, mm -hmm. and you said the program is about 33 weeks? Yes. So at the end, I guess, of it, do you, they have, like, someone that comes back for mentoring for these other men that are in there, or do we have... Um, he is pretty much the only case that we know of, of, I mean, they are able to come back to the program after they finish the program for free and as many times as they want to. Um, with the case of David, David came back and was, um, you know, he really wanted to give back and he really wanted to help. He didn't want to just go through the program again. He really wanted to give back. Other questions? Any, any questions? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you to Kendall. So if we can just give her another round of applause. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you did a great job. Um, so thank you all for joining us again um, for, you know, listening to Kendall's amazing presentation, um, for being, uh, you know, giving up your evening to come share it with us. We're sticking around. If you have any questions about our program, about Kendall's project, um, you know, we're happy to answer anything. If you'd like to stick around and chat, um, we're here. But other than that, we'd welcome you to walk around, take a look, um, you know, spend some time reading them, taking a look at the poses, um, the photographs, and help yourself to any refreshments. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, not for my stuff personally. I haven't really posted it anywhere. Um, this would be 
kind of the only thing, and this is going to be up on the SPS website, correct? Yeah, so I mean, they can, they can check it out there. Um, but I also put a link on there on one of the slides for um, my inspiration, which is the YouTube video, um, that they can check out as well. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, anybody can really contact me at any point. And yeah. Kendall, uh, Kendall does have a master's thesis to finish, so maybe I at do. the end of your master's thesis, if, if she builds on on this project with that, um, you know, you'll see her again in, in a year talking about that. Yes. So. Yeah. Huh. That's a very good question. Well, I mean, we, we um, had a lot of difficulty doing that with the adult men. Um, so it was basically just kind of like a lot of, a lot of work. It was like a lot of repetition where it was just kind of like they, we can't force them to do it. Um, and when we told them, we're not going to force you to do it. We're going to present you with the project. And if you, uh, want to really take a look at it and do some really good work with it, then that's up to you. Um, but we're not going to force you to do it. Like we, I, like I said before, we did meet with a lot of resistance with the men and some of them just really just didn't want to do it and just put down whatever they thought, you know, they wanted us to hear. And that probably will happen with the adolescent programs. Um, but you get those few, just like these men. Um, we got, these are 11 out of 33 men. Um, who actually put it down on paper and said, okay, you know, this, this is what I did and, and this is what, you know, this is what I want to do about it. Thank you. You're welcome.